Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Lisa Boucher. After l- short stints where Lisa trained polo horses, worked as a flight attendant, hairdresser, and bartender, she revamped her life and settled in as a registered nurse. For the past 29 years, she's worked with hundreds of women to overcome alcoholism, live better lives, and become better parents. She was prompted to write Raising the Bottom when she realized after 20 plus years of working in hospitals that doctors and traditional health care offer few solutions to people with addiction issues. She is the mother of two sons and lives in Ohio with her husband. Is addiction related to betrayal? My next guest is going to show you exactly how they go together. Don't worry, she's also going to show you what to do about it. Get ready for a powerful conversation with Lisa Boucher. Here she is. Okay, everybody. So would you ever think there's a link between betrayal and addiction. We're talking to Lisa Boucher today, and she's going to explain all about that. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Debbie. Happy to be here. Oh, uh, so excited to have you. So let's just get started with, you know, because we, we spoke briefly right before I hit record about, you know, a little bit about that link. And it's it's so interesting. And, and my listeners hear it all the time. I talk about, you know, we don't want to numb, avoid, distract. We want to see it, feel it, face it. And that's how we heal. But the pain is so great. So it's so easy to see why we may go towards or be headed for addiction with betrayals. But let's let's just start with with your story and, and then we'll we'll dive into that connection. Okay. So I think betrayal as as we were talking has many hats. And mine started with my parents. Um, and I know many, many people have this experience, especially I work with a lot of women who are trying to rebuild their lives after um, becoming married an addiction and whatnot. But, you know, the people that we're supposed to love and trust the most in my um, situation, they didn't do so well. My mother was an alcoholic. She was very loving and she was not abusive, but she was unable to parent or really function from the my earliest memories. So she didn't get sober till I was 21. So I feel like in many, many ways, I grew up without the the support and the wisdom of a mother. She was there, but she wasn't there. And then my father was was very angry, abusive, verbally, sometimes physically. Um, I think her alcoholism just stressed him to the max, and he had very few coping skills, and a somewhat tragic childhood of his own. So he never healed, and you know the saying, hurt people hurt people. And so that is how it was growing up. So I turned to addiction or started my addiction drinking at a very early age, at the age of 12. And I didn't realize until later, I also got sober relatively young in my late 20s, but I had started self-medicating as a child. You know, you pick up this beer or joint or whatever, those were the two things that I remember trying at a young age. And you realize not so much that you're looking to actually drink or smoke pot or whatever, but all of a sudden you feel different. Mm. So that I believe is how, well, I I know it's how addiction starts for many, many people. And and you know what, Lisa, I just want to go back to, so take us back to when you were 12 and you started, and you started drinking. Do you remember what you were thinking? Were you, were you, looking at it like uh, this is just seems fun or or it's a way to escape what do you remember any thoughts that were going through your mind at that time it more had to do with i had two older sisters that were experimenting and we were running amok as teenagers truly my mother was not able to um parent so well like i said so we're running amok and it was just something everyone was doing so i don't think i had the conscious in my mind that, okay, I want to escape, but I did like being out of the house. I also, I had a horse and that is what I'm sure kept me from getting into a teenage alcoholism because I spent copious amount of times with my horse and had a very idyllic place in which to ride. So I do believe that that saved me. But no, to answer your question, Debbie, it wasn't a conscious thought like, okay, I'm going to escape now. It's 
you're with teenagers, everybody's doing it. But I do remember getting the head spins from the beer and instead of thinking, oh, that's, I don't like that. I'm like, oh yes, I love that. Mm -hmm. And going and doing it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was around 12. And then you said, I remember when we first started speaking, you said you had more than one betrayal. Well, yes. Um, started with my parents, my sister. I have a sister who we haven't spoken in a year and a half. That's been very devastating because she was an addict for many years. And when she finally was trying to get her life together, I was the only one in the whole family other than my mother who was since passed. So my mother didn't get to see her get sober. But I helped her rebuild her life and get furniture and all of these things because she was in recovery. And I know how hard that early years, especially when you've imploded your life and nobody really in my, as far as my siblings was willing to help her. And I did so much for her, not expecting anything in return, but I did believe after all these years, I'm going to get my sister back. Mm -hmm. And that was really my motive. Um, I missed having her have two sisters and because of addiction, I might as well not have two sisters. Mm -hmm. So when she ended up meeting a guy that had a lot of money, that was the end of that. And she shut the relationship down. And I know why, because she didn't want, she never wants him to know who she really is. So wow. she had to cut me out and it's been beyond painful. Um, the pain of my husband had an affair and this is when I was just getting sober and he really, you know, you're not supposed to, in the program we learn, you don't dump your crap on other people to make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what he did. So that was a really hard time in my life. I'm trying to get sober. I've got twin babies. I'm in nursing school at the time. And then my husband dumps that on me. Wow. So... so what kind of meaning did you make out of all these experiences? Because, you know, we struggle with, with betrayal. We, we, we can so easily believe it must be me. It, I must be doing something wrong. It must be, you know, maybe I, I'm not lovable, worthy, deserving. And, and of course, this isn't the case, but these are, it's so easy for us to believe these things. So, you know, with the first, then the second and the third betrayal, how did you, how did you make sense of that? Well... I think for the first one with the parents, very hard to ended up in addiction with, with my husband. I think I was at a point in my life. Like I said, I was fairly new in sobriety. Have the, I've got all this stuff going on, but I had enough recovery in me, Debbie. Mm -hmm. and I knew it wasn't about me. So mm -hmm. I did not own that. And I realized this is about him. He cannot handle that. He gave up, his best drinking buddy. He cannot handle that my life was, he was not the primary focus in my life at all. He was, he was third or fourth down the list between keeping myself sane, taking care of my children and getting myself together. I had been in and out of college for 10 years when I was drinking. So now that I'm sober and I give birth to these twins, I, I had an overwhelming like the light came on, like, my God, if this marriage doesn't last, I need to be able to put food on the table. So I was supremely committed to getting through something um, after 10 years. And that's when I decided I'll be a nurse. At least I can, I see a light at the end of the tunnel and I knew I could get a job. And so, you know what? And, and I, I just, I just want to commend you right here because I, I imagine, I, I've, I haven't been through it, but just going through sobriety and just, and, and all, making all of those different changes must be challenging enough. And then here you are, a new mom. Uh, you know, I have four kids and, and I remember those days and it's grueling and you're so exhausted. You're so overwhelmed. You're so unsure about, you know, am I doing this right? <laughs> is this, uh, is this the way it's supposed to be? And here you are doing, doing all of this. And it would have been, it sounds like it could have been a really easy time for you to become, uh, to go back to drinking again. It is only by the grace of God that I didn't. You're absolutely right, Debbie, because those are the kinds of things that people throw in the towel because they just can't deal with the emotional pain. Mm -hmm. and I think what, what I did was compartmentalize that in, in a 
in a big way because I didn't have the emotional capital left to spend on this. And so how I handled it, number one, like I said, I had some insight. I knew it wasn't about me. I did. Um, I found some consolation in the woman he picked to have an affair with. She wasn't um, a young, you know, crazy kind of girl. She was actually a little older than him. And I found that very um, telling in a way, like, are you looking for a mother figure or someone to take care of you? So I could psychoanalyze that to the cows come home, but she was educated and well-spoken. And what I did is I called her and I said, you know, my husband told me about this and I believe he told you he wants to stay in the marriage and I hope that you will respect that. And she said, absolutely, I will. I think she was stunned when I called. There's that long pause kind of thing. And I told her, I understand how things could happen. I didn't blame her. It takes two. Mm -hmm. And I decided then and there, I, you know, my husband seemed generally contrite. I knew he loved me. That was never an issue. And maybe that's why I could forgive this. Um, but I was just, like I said, I didn't have the time to worry about it. And I decided I'm not going to be the, the person who was checking up on him. We didn't have cell phones and all that when this was going on, thank God. But I just, I said, I'm either going to trust him or I'm not. I decided to trust him. And I got busy with my life because I wanted to keep building myself up so that should he fall apart or leave the marriage, it was not going to be the end of my world. I was kind of done having people end my world. World. And Lisa, this I have to stop you because this yeah. sounds very logical and rational, but I know my listeners are saying, how, so tell us the practical, how did you actually do that? Just to say, I, I didn't have the time to spend on it. I mean, I, I'm, that sounds like a wonderful option. You know, when you make that decision and you do it, how did you prevent yourself from slipping into, am I doing the right thing? Can I trust him? All of that. Walk us through that because I know my listeners are saying, I would love to just compartmentalize it. How do you do that? Okay. So I think a lot of it had to do with having so many other outside entities or interests buying for my time. Mm -hmm. So if, if someone is struggling in that, I would suggest go take a class. If you're not working, find a part-time job, find a little job, find something that you can do that's going to get your mind off of feeling bad about yourself mm -hmm. and, and, and start practicing self-care. I knew I was doing the right thing for me. So as much as I was so crazy busy and overwhelmed, I was also taking care of myself. I was going to meetings. I was talking to people in recovery because I was making that a priority to stay sober. And we feel good about ourselves by doing the next right thing for us. And that is a self-care. It doesn't mean, I, I kind of get annoyed with the self-care of soaking in a bathtub. That never worked for me. I need to do something. Mm -hmm. So whether that be journaling my feelings, um, exercise has always been huge, preferably in nature. I don't really enjoy sweating it out at the gym, but I get a lot of peace and healing in nature. And even just taking a walk, it, it I can make sense of the world by looking at a gnarled tree mm. or um, a, a, some little ant on the sidewalk trying to struggle with. That speaks to me. And I look at all of the struggles that happen in the world with nature and people. And we can overcome if we don't allow that to define who we are. You know what? And I, I love what you're saying about doing something. And when we think of self-care, we, first of all, you know, we can just say, feel so guilty about it or think that it's selfish. But I, I love your definition of it and how it doesn't have to be soaking in the tub. It could be just, just being, getting involved in something other than you getting involved in just, you know, looking at something, experiencing something, because you can't sit and dwell and, and really focus on yourself if you're just engaged in other things. That is the worst thing you can do. You're right, Debbie, is to stay in your head. Um, get out of your head, get out of yourself. You know, they say depression is anger turned inward or another form of 
I don't know if you're familiar with Shinrin Yoku. It's a Japanese uh, word for forest bathing. Mm -hmm. And over in Japan, they have very, they use very few antidepressants because nature gives off these phytocines, which are actual chemicals that are, will in decrease depression, help you decrease anxiety, increase your immune system. So the recipe for feeling betrayed, feeling overwhelmed is, is like you said, get out of yourself, go help someone else. Mm -hmm. And I think my twins, that was my huge diversion. I didn't have time to think about myself because as anyone knows, raising you have four of your own, mm -hmm. when you have two screaming babies and my sons had colic for nine months. So there was very little time to sit around and think about how wronged I was. Um, and, and, you know, and it's painful. And I had one other experience. We took a young girl in and, and she lived with us for two years and she was addicted to alcohol and opiates. And then it's a complicated and way too long for the show. But she ended up leaving, just kind of cutting me off. Um, I guess she got back with her mother, I think. And, and that was... That was devastating. So, devastating. so let's just really get to that link between the betrayals and the addiction, because it's, it's, you know, I, I, I want to hear, cause I have my own idea. I, I would love to hear your, you know, the way you link one to the other. Maladjusted emotions is why most people self-medicate with alcohol, drugs, prescription drugs. So in order to, I guess, recover or find other healthier coping skills, you've got to dig deep and find some willingness to learn other coping skills because self-medicating is all that I knew. My mother, the, the, scoping, the coping skills that she taught us were get in the car, go fix your hair and put on some lipstick. So those don't translate well to adult life. And in my 20s, all I knew how to do was self-medicate with alcohol, with a little bit of cocaine, what with whatever. Mm -hmm. And then when you get out of that, um, you know, and many people don't, they stay in addiction or they stay in self-medication because it's too painful to look at their emotions, to look at their life. And here's a, here's a, a, a key point. We have to look at our part because even though I have been betrayed. I mean, I think when we're children, we, we are victims. There's not much we can do. But once we become adults, um, the people that betrayed me, my sister, the young girl that came into my life, my husband, these are all people that I willingly brought into my life. Mm -hmm. So do we, you know, it becomes, do we take, quit taking risks then? and try to love people. And I think even my husband said to me, he goes, Lisa, I don't understand how you can just forgive these people and not be angry and resentful. Mm -hmm. It kind of blows him away. I know he has some resentments about the way my sister and that other girl treated me. And I just told him, I can't live like that anymore because I will go back to drinking. Right. So how do I get rid of my resentments? I look at my part and I realized, I was a willing participant. I did what I did out of love. That can't be a bad thing. And I'm going to let the universe take care of the karma. Mm -hmm. And I did the right, I feel like I did the right thing. And those people are living better lives now. So is it because I did help them? Didn't regardless, I feel like I did a good thing and I'm able to let that go in recovery. I could, before recovery, I couldn't let anything go. And so I self-medicated. So how does recovery teach you how to let go? Well, I found my recovery through the 12 steps. And a lot of it is just principles for great living, realizing we can't control other people. We can only control, they, they say, visualize a hula hoop around you. Anything within that hula hoop is your business and anything outside of it, you've got to let it go. So I can't control other people. All I can do is be the best person I can, show love, forgiveness, um, 
those are principles that I live by now. And, and the 12 steps are so powerful. Can you share them? Um, yes. The, you want me to read the whole, all the 12 steps or just give you the brief synopsis? Brief. Okay. First step, your powers over alcohol, your life's unmanageable. Two and three, help you find a higher power. You come to believe that a power greater than yourself. A lot of people don't believe in God. I happen to believe in God, but whatever. It seems to work for everybody, even agnostics and atheists. Mm -hmm. Four and five, steps four and five are, they're, they're biblical, really. You're, you're looking at your part, your behavior, your right a sex inventory for people that have a lot of promiscuity in their story. That usually goes back to a father seeking approval or a male figure in their life that maybe abandoned them, abused them. So you start to see the patterns in people that chase relationships to help them feel better, to people with shopping addictions, gambling addictions. A lot of this maladaptive behavior goes back to our childhood. I've always said addiction is the birthplace of childhood. Mm -hmm. or childhood is the birthplace of addiction mm -hmm. many, many, because of the, the things that happen to us. So the fourth and fifth steps, you're, you're writing it down. And there's something about writing it down that allows people to be honest and gut you know, open and just lay it all out there. And then you need to share it with someone. And it doesn't say you go into a room of people and share it. Absolutely not. Lots of misconceptions there. You can share it with a therapist, a priest, who, or your best friend or the homeless person on the street, just so you share it with another human being. Mm -hmm. And what that does is there's something humbling. It, it finally is the smasher of the pride and ego. Mm. where and that is what drives behavior pride ego fear you get rid of those three things and people find a new life literally and i mean that it's so life-changing to realize how fear drives us how our ego and what we worried about what people may think. Um, it is a freedom to be able to say, you know what, I really love myself and I no longer care what other people think. It doesn't matter. It's like you you just gave yourself wings right there. Mm -hmm. so that's what the steps help do. And then in six and seven, you're looking at your character defects for when is your ego running the show? You, you, you become more aware of those things that I just um, explained of when they're driving the behavior so that you can say, ah, I'm, I'm feeling fearful. That's why I want to get in there and control this situation. Or that's why I want to control my adult children because I'm afraid of the outcome won't be good. And, and that's when we got to start turning that step over to our higher power and realizing we need to allow people the di dignity of making their own mistakes so they too can learn the lessons that they're supposed to learn. Mm -hmm. And then it's just 11 and 12 is really carrying the message like I'm doing now, um, helping others. I've made it a vocation with my book, uh, Raising the Bottom, with my Facebook page, with I started a sober group for women or anybody who's curious about sobriety or thinking about sobriety so that they could come in and join us and, and talk there. It's a closed group for women. So that's what I do. And it feeds my soul to see a woman change her life. Um, I'm happy to see men change their lives as well, but I'm more focused on the women because for obvious reasons. And I know some of the issues that, that we have. And I've had a lot of people reach out to me and people are changing their lives and reading Raising the Bottom and realize I've been self-medicating and sleepwalking through my life and they're done doing it. And they and, want to change. Yeah. And this is why I say sometimes a life crisis is your greatest gift because that's what wakes what wakes you up and gives you another opportunity to just it wakes us up, shakes us up, and, and has us reevaluate how we've been living instead of sleepwalking. Just like you said, what were some of the greatest lessons you've learned in life? Um, greatest lessons is you've got to be okay with yourself. You know, I learned. I went to this was probably the most profound thing that that hit me. I was in Sicily. I went alone. 
And I was in a, a little town where there are no tourists, Santa Flavia. So I'm walking down the street in Santa Flavia. I know nobody. I did go to stay to take a little language and um, do some genealogy. But what the greatest lesson, it, it, it seeped into the marrow of my bones. And never underestimate your insignificance. That is the greatest lesson I think we can all learn. Say that again. Never under, I'm writing that down. Never underestimate your insignificance. Okay. And what do you mean by that? I mean, it keeps us right size. When we, it dawned on me, it was almost a very spiritual moment. We come into the world alone. We're going to leave alone. Mm -hmm. Our journey is between us and the God of our understanding. And that is the lane where I want to stay. It doesn't matter about my house, my possessions, my success. None of that really matters. And when you go to a foreign country and plop yourself in there where nobody knows who you are, who cares if you disappear off the face of the earth in the next five minutes, who would have known, you realize how insignificant you are. Mm -hmm. And that is a humbling, it's almost empowering though, because we, I realized we're all insignificant, but we all do create, add to the cosmic whole. And so whatever little imprint we want to make on the world, like you're doing Debbie with your podcast and helping all of the people that you help and I found my gift of writing. So now I'm writing books. Um, and, and we are making a difference in the world and we're helping people. But yet in our own little sphere, we're not that significant. We're insignificant. And, and you know, it's interesting. I, I, I kind of feel like this a little, a little bit differently whenever I fly. And we, you know, the, the plane takes off and you look and here we are where I feel my problems and my challenges are so big big to me. And then you see all of the houses and all of the cars and, and it's like everybody else has their own thing going on in that house and in that house and in that house. And it just really, it always creates such an amazing perspective for me. It sounds sort of like a, that's it is like that where you have to like, yeah, you're looking at it from a different vantage point and realize most of our problems of our, are really of our own making. I mean, if you think about it, we, I, I looked at some of the relationships, you know, that we uh, get into, and, and even with boyfriends and all the people that touch your lives, stop trusting untrustworthy people. Mm -hmm. And that is what I did in, in the instance with my sister. Um, I, I'm not going to say that about my husband because he is very trustworthy, but at that point in our lives, there was just a lot of chaos and going on. But, we, you know, I talk to people and, and women, especially they're betrayed by lovers and stop dating on emotion, emotionally unavailable people. Right. Um, stop making the same mistakes. And until we see our patterns, we don't really know what our patterns are. Mm -hmm. so, that, yeah. Great advice yeah. right there. Right. We have to find out what are the patterns in our lives that we keep doing over and over and over. Alcoholics tend to marry other alcoholics. When you hear people that have been married three, four, and five times, I always know there's alcohol involved. Almost invariably, without a doubt, in one of the partners, there's alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. And we keep finding those same kinds of partners. Um, we just gravitate to emotionally unavailable people. If you're a woman and your father abandoned you, you're going to keep having bad relationships with men because you're seeking that approval instead of fixing yourself first, loving yourself first, working through that and realizing your father didn't abandon you. He was broken and did what he did because he couldn't love himself. Mm -hmm. There's that saying, if we knew better, we'd do better. And, and exactly. those people we choose, it's not that they're good for us. They're just so familiar. And it gives us another opportunity exactly. to see things so clearly so that we can make those changes that we need to make. Right. What do you want to make sure everyone knows as we wrap up? I would like them to know that change is possible if you have a if you're worried about alcohol in your life at all, please find me on social media. Check out my book, Raising the Bottom. Um, 
It's helped many. And I just want people to know change is possible, whether it's depression, anxiety, whatever is going on with you, that's an inside job. And there is so much help out there, but you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. You have to be willing to feel uncomfortable and work through whatever it is that you're struggling with so you can get to the other side and not make your whole life about making the same mistakes over and over and mm -hmm. over. And sobriety is possible too. And everybody knows that willingness is my favorite word. You, it, when you're willing to change, anything is possible. Lisa, I want to thank you so much. Really, this was so insightful. And uh, really, you, as I always say, face it, feel it, heal it. And you are the perfect perfect example of someone who did just that. So I'm so grateful for your time. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. I love so many things about what Lisa said, like childhood is the birthplace of addiction, not having the emotional capital to spend on certain issues, and that maladaptive emotions are the reasons we self-medicate. Stay in touch with Lisa by joining her Facebook group and getting her book, Raising the Bottom. We'll have all of her information in the show notes at pbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. Self-care can mean anything. Just find something that takes your attention off of you and onto something that's calming and soothing. That does doesn't mean you're avoiding facing your feelings. It means that while you're doing the work to make sense and meaning out of your experience, you're not marinating in the negativity because all that does is keep you stuck and sick. Of course, those feelings lead to illness and disease. So to see what's lingering in the wake of your betrayal, take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz at pbtinstitute.com forward slash quiz. And let us support you. Go to Facebook and join our group, Women Hacking Betrayal, where we give information, tools, and support to help you move forward and heal once and for all. Can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough.